Thank you very much, Alex, for your introduction. It was very nice. I didn't know that uh, so many things were uh, uh, available uh, to the public. Um, and uh, yes, I did uh, spend my entire childhood in Pompeii. I left above when I was 10 years old, and uh, but always lived around the slopes of the volcanoes, not always in Pompeii, but in other towns as well. And uh, like Alex said, there was a fascination to just look at this volcano, and I climbed it, and I went to the Pompeii ruins time and time again. Anyway, so tonight, what I'll talk about is the story of Pompeii, and, uh, but I also want to point out, this is the uh, say from Will Durant, who lived almost 100 years, American, and he said, civilization exists by geological consent, subject to change without notice, and he's so right, so very right. And it's something that uh, we don't really um, uh, we don't really appreciate, but the, certainly the danger is there, and it's always not just with volcanoes, earthquakes, but also with meteorite impacts. Okay, so let's let's look a little bit at volcanoes now, <clears throat> and there are volcanoes, super volcanoes, and super eruptions. These are not just funny names; they're real things. And the ultimate geological hazard I'm now reading and would devastate the impact on civilization and long-term climatic effects. And this is something that is very important to bear in mind because today global climate change is so much in the news. Uh, I think they largely uh, evade or ignore volcanic eruptions in this business. The released energy and destruction is only matched, like I said before, by meteorite impacts. Now, the destructive capacity of volcanoes and supervolcanoes, and the, di the difference between the two is purely arbitrary, obviously. It's something we set up at 1,000 cubic kilometers of erupted material. And the explosive potential is related to the amount of gas, which we say normally use the word volatiles, such as water, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, H2S, and so on and so on. And these explosive eruptions are triggered by tectonic perturbation. In other words, if there is an earthquake somewhere, and that earthquake can actually transmit um, waves 2, 3,000, 4,000 kilometers away, and all it needs is just a little trigger, and the Arctic eruption will come. Even if the volcano is thousands of kilometers away, it doesn't matter. It's just a little touch that is necessary to get it off. And explosive eruptions are triggered by, like I said, by earthquakes can be triggered by earthquakes or gas saturation. In other words, the gas accumulates in a magma chamber and, and, and it just stays there. If the gas is very, very much, um, the pressure is very high, it can break through. Or, and like I said, if an earthquake happens, and it's like opening a bottle of champagne, so to speak, and up it goes again. And in other words, it's driven by gas at all times. And a mixture of gas and pyroclastics can enter the atmosphere and can go up in the sky, entraining heated air, and can rise up to 35 kilometers into the atmosphere. Now, this is some examples just to give you a, an appreciation of what happens. The, the volcanic eruptive explosive index, which is up here somewhere, right there, uh, and you have a range of so we say values that go from near zero to about eight. And as you can see, Kilauea in, in Hawaii, that people we see on television all the time, and we think, oh, this is a great eruption. Actually, it's very quiet in terms of uh, explosive eruptions. And you can see that the plume height is very, very, very little, but 0.1 of a kilometer. And then you go down the scale, and you go down to, say, Mount St. Helens, a lot of publicity. We've heard of Mount St. Helens, but again, it's quite small. And then we go to Pinatubo in the Philippines, and Taupo, New Zealand, uh, 26,000 years ago. That was quite large. And the next one in this table that I have here, Toba, 74,000 years ago. That was a huge, gigantic eruption. These are the supervolcanoes. So from 1,000 on, we call it supervolcanoes. Now, fortunately, how often do these things happen? Well, the Kilauea, Stromboli, in the Mediterranean Sea, they every day. The Galeras in Colombia, weekly. And then Nevado de Ruiz in South America, too, once a year. Sofria, 10 years. Mount St. Helens, every 50 years. Pinatuba, every 100 years. Taupo, every 1,000 years. 
and of course, fortunately, taught by 10,000, 100,000 years. The only problem here is that we just don't know when. It could be tomorrow, it could be 100,000 years from now, and at an interview I had yesterday with the ABC, there is absolutely no way that we can tell when. And uh, in this respect, I would like to tell you the little story of my colleague and uh, classmate, uh, Giuseppe Luongo, who then became the head of the Volcano Observatory in Mount Vesuvius. And when I went to see him some years ago, he said, that, well, he gets interviewed by the media because they want to know when is Vesuvius erupting. And if he says, I don't know, then he's an incompetent. And if he says it will be in the year 2003 or March, then he's, he's, he's in trouble because he, you know, he will cause panic. So either way, you just can't win. But the truth is, we just don't know. Now, what is important in the eruptions is the pyroclast, what the geologists call pyroclastic flow or pyroclastic current. And that is the most destructive erupting phenomenon. So you can go to Hawaii, and you can see lava coming out of the crater, and that's fine. So long as you maintain your distance, there is no danger. But with pyroclastic flow, it's a different story. And this is what destroyed Pompeii, Herculaneum, and all the towns around it. So what is it? Well, it's a hot fluidized mass of fragmental material, ash and gas due to an explosive eruption, obviously. And, and it goes up in the, in the sky, of course, and then it comes down again. And it's very hot, hundreds of degrees. And the pyroclastic flow can reach speeds over 100 kilometers an hour and can travel as much as 200 kilometers from the, from the source and can cover areas of up to 20,000 square kilometers around the source of the volcano. Okay, so I've got the sketch here. And basically what we see, you see the eruptic column, see if this thing works. Yep, okay, so there's a magma chamber. It gets filled up with gas, and then it goes through the conduit. Okay, and then we have a number of things happening. You've got lava flow, which comes down here. You have a lahar, which is just a mix of mud and other rocks. And then the, this is the eruptive column. It goes up in the sky. The wind can carry the ash for thousands of kilometers. In fact, it can even go around the, the entire planet Earth. It has happened. We have evidence, geological evidence, that this has happened in the past time and time again. And then, of course, you have the, as the pyroclastic flow goes up, it reaches the level of buoyancy, and then it comes back down, and that is the pyroclastic flow, and that is what destroys things around. And that's what the danger is. Now, this is quite an interesting one because it shows the actual volumes of eruptions. Now, Mount St. Helens uh, has had a great publicity, as we all know, television, movies, and so forth. Look at that. It's nothing. It's really nothing. Mount Pinatubo was a big eruption. Nothing. Next one, Krakatoa. That was quite large, actually, and we know that because we have historical records, as we have a Tambora. Then we go up to Toba and Yellowstone, and look at the amount of material. The Yellowstone, two million years ago, and Toba, like I mentioned earlier, 74,000 years ago. Look at the volume of eruptive material. That is the supervolcano, ladies and gentlemen. That is what can destroy civilization, indeed it can. And unless we precede them in destroying ourselves, the volcanoes will. Now... The Tober eruption, just to give you an idea, in Indonesia, 74,000 years ago, there's a locality there shown by the little square. And that is the extent of the... The little square shows more or less the extent of the pyroclastic flows, which, of course, don't travel all that far, but the extent of the ash cloud is quite considerable, as you can see. Not only that, but it also caused a, several tsunamis, and the red lines that you see there are tsunamis which hit the coast of Western Australia, by the way, as well as India and Africa and Madagascar. Now, let's go to Yellowstone, which is a, a super volcano. The Yellowstone volcanic field has produced the largest eruption so far documented in a geological record, as far as we know. Actually, it's not quite correct because I've had the pleasure of working in Central Australia in the Musgrave, and uh, we have evidence there going back 1,070 million years ago of a super, a super eruption there as well. But fortunately, it's all in the geological records in the rocks. But just to tell you that, to, that these things 
happened in the geological history of the planet Earth. So the last documented in the geological record for Yellowstone is 2.1 million years ago, with emission of gas from fumaroles estimated at 45,000 tons per day. Okay, that 45,000 tons per day, which is about 5% of the global volcanic flux, mostly carbon dioxide and H2S. Now, if there were to be a similar type of eruption today, or sometime in the near future, that is the area they will cover in the U.S. Okay, that will give you an idea that Will Durant, when he said civilization exists by geological consent, there it is. Now, the Yellowstone caldera system was four, six hundred, the first eruption two million years ago, but it continued on, and 640,000 years ago, the entire system was formed. And the caldera today measures about 80 kilometers, about 50 kilometers, and is a site of thousands of earth tremors each year, hundreds a day sometimes. In the Campi Flegre near Naples, which is part of the uh, volcanic system around Vesuvius, I'll show you that later, generates cycles of uplifts. In other words, the, the, the ground rises, we call bradycism, and the ground falls down again. And it goes up and down, up and down, because the magma chamber gets filled up with magma, and the magma comes, pushes the land up, and it goes down again, depending on the amount of gas and how much gas can be emitted, how much gas is stored. And this is beautifully recorded if you, got, if you happen to visit the uh, town of Pozzuoli, which, by the way, is where Sofia Loren was born, <laughs> just to, make, to put it into, into a more uh, uh, <laughs> publicity perspective. In the last 2,000 years, this, these, this columns, which is an ancient market town, have gone up and down. And we can see that because you see little uh, uh, clams and other um, sea, sea, sea clams and they bite into the, into the columns. And then, of course, you got the ash flows. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, or the, the pyroclastic flows. And the, the last one near Naples was 30,000, 39,000 years ago. It's called the Campanian Tuff and erupted from the Campi Flegrei caldera and this is a fairly recent example. And there it is. Look at the extent of this thing. It's quite frightening. Okay? That is one flow. And uh, now, that's another one. On May 8th, 1902, a pyroclastic flow destroyed the town of St. Pierre in, the, in Martinique, and 30,000 people perished in, in a few minutes, except for three criminals. And the reason for that is because they were in the dungeons. Okay? So eventually, they didn't know what was happening, and then they heard the noise. And when they came out, they came out and they were alive. And they were, so that was one case in which crime does pay. And in fact, they were not put back in prison, by the way. They were freed. And fair enough. And this is another, lay, another uh, example, not far from uh, where I lived for many years, the Toro del Greco, Tower of the Greek, by the way, it means. And uh, on the south flank of Mount Vesuvius, and these pyroclastic deposits were formed 3,700 3, years ago. And this is one of the major eruptions, again, of Naples. And this pyroclastic surge traveled some 22 kilometers to the northwest, covering an area which is now covered by Na the city of Naples. Uh, yes, I've sold my flat in Naples. So I now live in Dunkirk, so I'm very, very <laughs> comfortable with that. Now, one to watch out, a major supervolcano is Mount Marsili in the Tyrrhenian Sea, and that is covered by sea. It's about 2,000 meters uh, below the sea level on the seafloor. And people, the volcano observatory of Mount Vesuvius, they're watching it very carefully because that could be a major eruption in the future. Just as an example. What I want to show you now is uh, the famous Santorini eruption, which is quite a major, major. So Santorini Day, Pompeii in Italy, as you can see, Santorini is in Greece, of course, in the, Olean, in the uh, Aegean Islands. And it's quite interesting because that eruption effectively occurred 3,660 years before present and caused the destruction of this good geological and historical evidence, it caused the destruction of the Minoan civilization on Crete. What is interesting, and some people have speculated that, of course we have no proof, but people have speculated on that, that it might actually account for the legend of Moses walking across the 
dried out the sea from Egypt. Because about that time, that's when the tsunami, the eruption occurred, the tsunami happened, and one, and one of the features of tsunami, not all tsunamis, but some tsunamis, the, the sea withdraws and then it comes back in. It may be just a, a, it, a, a, just a legend, we don't know, but it so happens that there is some coincidence in, in, in dates. Now, let's go to southern Italy, and there they go. So Vesuvius, there's a Vesuvius volcanic structure there, and that is the Campi Flegrei and the Ischia. Okay, that's what that one I mapped for my thesis, by the way. And so you have one, two, three major volcanic structures, and the poor city of Naples sits right in there. And Pozzuoli, by the way, is there. Oh boy, don't buy a property in there. I don't I wouldn't advise that. Because, like I said before, one of these is going to, they are, these three volcano, volcanic structures are alive and well. They are by no means extinct, not at all. And of course, the extent of the volcanic material, as you can see, this is all covered, and it goes quite a, quite a few kilometers away from it. But it's quite a major. And then, of course, there are the islands of Stromboli and other islands all the way down there. So it's quite a, quite a, it, Italy, like New Zealand, actually, it's a, it's a, it's a, a land of um, uh, volcanism, not, not only with the Italians, but also by land. Okay, this is just a couple of pictures uh, from 1944 eruptions, which indeed, yes, I was there, and I do remember bits and pieces of it. I was only a child, obviously, but I do remember the fireworks in the sky, and to me it was all a great, great fun, because I did not understand the dangers of it. But a little village, not far from where I lived, got completely destroyed by the lava flows. So... Vesuvius is important historically, certainly not only from the volcanological <coughs> point of view, but also from the history point of view. And in fact, we might say that the first volcanologist was a Roman uh, general. I'll come back to that in a minute. And Vesuvius is a very famous volcano. It's also one of the most studied in the world. And the Arctic cone was constructed within the Mount Soma caldera. I'll show you that in a minute, which was formed about 17,000 years ago. The caldera wall channels the lava. So in effect, the caldera, the wall of the caldera is a little bit of a safety net, if you like, because the lava comes down from the cone, hits the wall, and has to go sideways. So if you live on the other side of the caldera wall, you're reasonably safe. Not entirely, but reasonably. The 79 AD eruption destroyed Pompeii, Herculaneum, and many other small towns all around the slopes of the volcano. And since 79 AD, Another event occurred in 1631 with pyroclastic flow reaching the coast and causing a huge amount of destruction. Okay, so there it is. That's the central cone, which you get, there's a track that you can actually walk all the way up if you like. And this is the caldera wall in that area. And this is 1944 lava. It just came out and hit the wall and it came down this way and it destroyed that village that I showed you before. Now, this is taken from National Geographic. It's quite nice because it, it beautifully, as, as usually is the case with National Geographic, they make beautiful, beautiful sketches. There's Mount Vesuvius there. Okay, this is the peninsula. This, all the tourists go there, Sorrento, Amalfi, etc., etc. Uh, you kind of are fairly safe, I suppose, but this is the danger area, and this is the Campi Flegrei um, Caldera, sitting there, and you can see the last eruption here, by the way, was in 1544, 1545, something like that. Okay, about 500 years, because we, geologically speaking, it's nothing, it was yesterday. And this is the extent of the destruction caused by the 79 AD eruption around here. Right, so at the time, in 79 AD, that is what Vesuvius looked like. And after, that's it. So all that material got blown away. And Pompeii was sitting there somewhere. This is what we have today still, but, but, but changed, I guess. But more or less, that's what we see today. So this is the main crater, and this is the caldera wall that I mentioned before. So when the lava comes out, it comes down here, it comes down this way. But whenever there is a pyroclastic eruption, well, things are not so good after that, after all. But this can be destroyed but if I had to buy a property, I would buy it here and not there. <laughs> <coughs> All 
Okay, now ge geologists can tell, can do some studies in the field, and of course, and they can actually estimate the extent of airfall, that was ash that comes down from the sky, or pyroclastic flows. So this is some example. This is the, the taken from a geological map of uh, published in 1986, I think, if that's right, um, sponsored by my colleague and friend uh, Giuseppe Longo. And he, and you can see, you can see the extent. But what you could do, you do look at the at the pyroclastic products, and you can measure the when it was put out, how much, what the, what the thickness is, and you have an idea of an extent of these things here. So on the right hand side. The eruption occurred in 3,800 before present. It's called a Plinian eruption, as I'll explain shortly. And you can see the extent of the pyroclastic flows in meters. Okay, so it's nine meters there, and then, and then it goes down to six meters. I mean, of course, the, the thickness decreases with distance from the crater. The next one is AD 79 Pompeii. And you can see the extent of the ash. And that ash was really, really bad because that, the ash contains a lot of gas and people do, do die because of the gas emitted, the volatiles emitted by the ash. And this is how the Pliny the Elder, he was out, he was the, um, uh, generally the, in charge of the Roman fleet in, uh, in, uh, stationed in, in Pozzuoli. And, and of course, he then tried to help people and he went out with his boat and he died because of the of the gas emitted from the from the asphalt. 472 AD, another eruption, and again to show you this time the ash goes in that that depends on the wind of course and the prevailing winds and it goes up to the northeast and again measure of the pyroclastic flow on that side. This just to show you the kind of the, what volcanologists do amongst the other things. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe it's a bit too much here, but it, well, here we, before the Vesuvius erupted in, in August 24, 79, there was no human record or knowledge that the mountain was in fact a volcano. A major earthquake did occur a few years earlier, but no one, obviously, there were no geologists those days, there was no connection with the actual volcano. Pliny the Younger, who is the nephew of Pliny the Elder, made a record of what he saw from across the Bay of Naples. He, at the time, he was living in Misenum, which is a nice place. I used to go there with my dad and have a swim. And his uncle was Pliny the Elder. He was the commander of the fleet in the Bay of Naples. He was also a scholar, a historian. And, of course, all we know about Romans is uh, gladiatorial fights and so on and so on. But, in fact, there was a lot. This is Hollywood, of course, but the real story is that there's a hell of a lot more than just gladiatorial fights and and uh, and other things. They were very uh, like Pliny uh, the Elder showed. They were scholars and they, was, they did a lot of poetry. They did research and so on and so on. But Pliny the Elder dictated notes to his to his scribe while he tried to rescue residents. And like I mentioned earlier, he died as a result of trying to save people. And since destroying Pompeii and Herculane, Vesuvius erupted a few more times, obviously, as we know, and 1944 was the last eruption. Now, just a little digression, something about Italy's peoples and culture of the time. And that's quite interesting, because I do, I do as a hobby, I do look into ancient uh, Italian history. And you can see that up in the north were Celtic tribes, the Etruscans, we all know, that's the Tuscanese today. And then, of course, the central Italy was mostly Latins, Latin speakers, I should say. And they, they are the true blue Italians, okay? All the others are just foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and then, of course, the Latin speakers were all the way down to Sicily, as a matter of fact. And then we have the Brutium, the Calab where Calabria is now. Nobody knows where they came from. The Etruscans, nobody knows where they came from. And, of course, the Sardinians, um, which had a Phoenician, a Phoenician connection. Um, and that's about it. But what is surprising, by the way, just, just I'll throw that in as a digression, that uh, the recent DNA research, which was published by Scientific American a few years ago, showed that these people, the DNA is still of these people, Celtic tribes in the north, that was a shock to most Italians. They didn't realize they were Celtics there, what they do. And, uh, and the Latins and the, um, 
and the, um, the Brutzi and the Greeks, sorry, I mentioned, mentioned the Greeks, of course, the DNA is still very much in the Italian population today, 2,000 years later. Unbelievable. Etruscans, we don't know. The, the, we wiped them out. Um, but that's history. Okay, now let's go into Pompeii. This is from uh, one of the websites. I think if you can read that, you can look at it yourself. And this is obviously a sketch. And this is the uh, work done by my uh, colleague Longo, Giuseppe Longo. And this is what you see here is a plan of the uh, Pompeii. Now, remember, we're talking about two, three thousand years ago. By the way, all these towns like Pompeii, Noceria, Herculaneum, they've been there for, they were the, the settlements of the ancient Italian people, in fact, the Latins. And they've got back three, four thousand years, a long, long, long time. And, but look at this, uh, this is incredible, because this is effectively the plan of a modern town. There's no question about it. Then this is a window into Western, Western civilization, Western culture. This does not just belong to Italy, it belongs to all of us. And uh, this is the uh, sketch of the, uh, the Mount Vesuvius there. But remember, this is only about two-thirds of what is actually excavated. There is more to it. There's another, at least uh, Giuseppe Longo reckons there's another third to go. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, the problems are that the, there are houses and people are living around. It's not easy. But as you can see, the, uh, the, the situation was that you had streets, right angle streets. And, of course, insula is what we call today a block. And, and the streets were named one, two, three, and so forth, and so forth. So the Americans didn't, did not invent first street, second street, first street, we did. <laughs> a little view of uh, today's, uh, it's black and white. I took this from a paper by Luongo. Um, that's what you see today. Like I mentioned, it's only about uh, two-thirds of the entire, possibly of the entire city. Okay. Now, so much for volcanology. Let's have a look at these famous ruins. I don't know if some of you probably have been there. This shows the entrance to the theaters. This is one of the theaters. It's, it's really amazing. It really is, because it looks like a modern situation. Not, not, this, you're looking at, at uh, buildings that are over 2,000 years old. Uh, yes, and I wanted to show that these are the modern homes there. So you can't go in there. You have to you left to expropriate those people, and uh, I don't think they're too keen to do that. Okay, this is a small Greek style theater. A Greek had a great influence in the southern Italy, certainly, and even with the Romans, the, uh, the, Greek, uh, the uh, Greek had a, a huge influence philosophically and historically. This is another theater called the Great Theater. And look at this, a public water, uh, water supply. This is absolutely fantastic. And, uh, oh, and there's a pub, a wine shop, or a, what is today we call a pub. Basically the same thing. And, okay, so there's uh, this three different shots. And look at this. And there's a pig here, by the way. Still preserved. And we make b big fuss about you want to go a wood fire pizza, you go to Subiaco. But boy, we had it a long, long time ago. <laughs> okay, and there you go. That's an oven wood fire. I don't know if they made pizza, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did. This is the main drag called Via Abundancia, which means uh, the way of the abundance. And sure, it was because, of the, by the way, Pompeii was the, effectively the, the settlement of, the, it started off as a settlement of uh, local people, but then it became uh, like a, a holiday, holiday place like uh, Margaret River, I suppose, or something like that. And this is the main drag, and you can see the um, pedestrian crossings there. And there it is, this is the pedestrian crossing. And these are the um, tracks left by the chariots. And I'll, I'll give another, another, uh, <laughs> another digression here. That distance is, in fact, the exact distance used early by the railways in, in Britain because they followed the old Roman roads, which go straight, okay? And, they, and that was the distance of the railway used in those days. Can you believe it? Based on the backside of two horses and a Roman chariot behind it. A back street, nothing special about it. This is the gymnasium. That's how it was called. 
which I guess is the equivalent of today's gym, but at least you got ventilation. You don't have to put up with loud music and uh, and uh, and uh, air conditioners. I think they had a better choice here. Better. But, uh, there you go. They, they see the houses there, modern houses there. So you really can't keep on digging all the time, unfortunately. This is the public bath, the uh, the um, ancient Italians, the Romans, as they called, they're fi- they're the fixation of the baths, a bit like the Japanese do today, I suppose. And uh, they were absolutely beautiful. And look at this. Eh? And uh, that was a, not a joke. I said a place to gossip, but it was true. That's exactly what they did. And this is where um, the local administration came and went, and it's a little bit like uh, Julia, Julia Gillard and um, Julian and uh, and uh, came on Rad. You know, th- this was done here. All that thing was done here. Okay, this is the ceiling. Look at this beautiful ceiling. And the bathtub. Nothing has changed. It's exactly as it is today. Okay, same thing again. Unbelievable. And this is an interesting one. It really caught my imagination at the time when I visited this particular, area, this particular house. The ash flow came through the door. It picked up that wash basin and it slammed it against the, other, the opposite side. And, of course, when they excavated this, they, they, they removed it and put it back to where it was. But look at that. There's the ash flow all being dug out, of course. And that is the imprint left by the, by the wash basin against that. A patrician's house, which is called Villa dei Misteri, which means the Villa of the Mysteries. I don't know why it's called that, by the way, but it's always been known like that. It's really a beautiful place. This is the washing area where you wash your clothes. Servants' quarters, not bad for servants. A lounge called Impluvium. Impluvium, pluvium means rain, so because rain came from through the, through the opening there and it filled up that little tub in there. And this is absolutely great. This is, the again, the Villa dei Misteri, the family room with wall paintings, perfectly preserved, unbelievable. It's really incredible. Perfectly preserved, okay? And look at this. All the colors, everything is there. And the lady on the left-hand side is the matrona, which is, in fact, the lady of the house. And more... Uh, frescoes showing mythical scenes on the other side. A wonderful thing because a, a, the, a, a couple of hundred years ago when the first archaeologists started excavating, they came across these kind of empty spaces in the ash. And somebody had this bright idea of pouring in, um, I think it was something like... Uh, um, gypsum or something like that, that they put in and, and they fill up the cavity and they pulled up and they, with the exact shape of the human body, but still with some bones and other things left behind. And if you visit Pompeii, you see dogs and uh, slaves are still with their shackles and people, you know, and, and couples embracing and dogs and so on. It's really incredible. They see, well, there you go. There's one here. Um, human cast is trying to help each other out. This is another one that attracted my attention. This, by the way, is not from Pompeii, it's from Herculaneum. Herculaneum was hit by the pyroclastic flow, fair and square, whereas Pompeii was first um, um, hit by by ash fall rather than pyroclastic. And so this guy was hit from behind, and of course, and and it was obviously died, but interesting thing, this is from National Geographic too, they reconstructed this this fellow, and uh, from the from these armaments, they could see that he was from um, from a legion that was stationed in Palestine, and uh, so he was a, a a cavalry man because they could tell that by the because the bones on his knees were a little bit uh, consumed, so to speak, because he was obviously riding a horse. And uh, the interesting thing uh, from the like I said, from his he, he was on leave, and the the military service at the time was 20 years. And whenever you went on leave, you had to do community service. So he had a, he had a backpack with implements like uh, an axe and a knife and so on. And, of course, he went home at, on leave at the wrong time, poor fellow, and uh, so he got it. And, um, but interestingly, because the, uh, the, from the buckle on his belt, uh, 
they could tell that it was from a, a legion that was stationed in Palestine. And uh, so this is the year 79, and so 20 years service, Palestine, this is when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So somebody suggested that the book may be the punishment. Okay, this is my last slide, just the city of Naples, which is my hometown, really. And there's Mount Vesuvius, the volcano observatory, the first in the world since there. This is where the Greeks, by the way, Naples was founded by the Greeks. In fact, the word Napoli means Neapolis, which means new town. In 800, it, about 3,000 years ago, of course. Uh, and uh, so that's where they landed. Pompeii is about there. Herculaneum is about here. And my house, the one I sold some time ago, was about there. That concludes. I acknowledge the help of Murray Jones, who done a lot of these drawings, and, um, and Tom Linnae, the geological survey, who put the PowerPoint together. And the, if you wish to know more, you can look out of these articles on uh, by longer. They quite uh, they good articles because they're not they're not highly technical, so anybody can understand them. If anyone wishes to have these uh, articles, you can contact me, and you can have a PDF for that. Thank you very much.